how much does pattern recognition affect our calculation process in a real game? Why do we need to study tactics or try to beat our record on Puzzle Rush? Well, it's really for moments like these and games like this where the young Jonas Bier, rising star out of Denmark, remember that name, took down the Ukrainian Grandmaster Alexander Moisenko by recognizing and considering a particular type of tactical pattern that may have even been missed by the veteran when the combination started. Let's dive right in and see what happened in this critical moment. White is up the exchange, but Black has some compensation for it, right? Currently an extra pawn and a very well centralized piece. But as you start to really add things up and take stock in the position, you get a sense and you can almost smell that there's something very awkward about Black's setup. The white queen is barreling down against the black king on g8. Because of that, the g7 pawn is actually pinned, which makes the f6 square a little more open for business than first meets the eye. Now, this square is currently protected very well, and black might actually even be threatening the e5 pawn. However, when we add the fact that we have these potential tactics to the idea that we have two rooks not on exactly their most useful files or squares yet, but potentially ganging up on a piece that tends to be kind of critical for all of Black's defensive ideas. Those sort of things start to add up in your head and push you to calculate combinations, and that's exactly what the youngster did here when he started with the move knight takes c4. A very good move that protects e5, so there's no knight takes e5, and unleashes the defense on the rook on d4. The problem is that this may actually just be allowing Black to win back his material, or at least that's what Moisenko thought. He played the move knight to b3. With this tempo on the rook and the fact that there's still a threat on the knight, it looks like white's going to have a little bit too many threats to juggle. However, Bier had gone deeper. He plays the move rook a7, and after losing the knight back on c4, he takes on d7 right away, eliminating the knight and opening up the threat of knight f6 check. Now, Moisenko's a very strong grandmaster. I think he saw this idea coming. When he takes back, he's thinking that worst case scenario, if you take on d7, yes, you've won back your material, but I'm not going to take you and let you fork me here on f6. I can bring my queen to a5. Suddenly, we have a double attack on e5 and e1, and actually having analyzed this with an engine, I can tell you that probably the best result white could hope for here is actually just equality. Things like knight f6 check, king h8, and even taking on c4 might be met by knight c5, but even if they're not, even if black just takes here and we get a big trade, this type of position doesn't really offer white a lot of winning chances, especially when the queen is so well centralized and the rook is coming to b8. I know I looked at it for a little while, more than I probably should have before recording the video. So with that combination being the first idea you would consider when you start this whole thing, it's possible Moisenko saw the whole thing coming but thought, all right, you're going to win this material, but what's the big deal? Okay, even if you play knight of six check first, I move my king, and when you take back the bishop, I'm going to move my queen, and you really don't have that much. But it was this move that I believe Bier had calculated from the beginning that turns the table. He takes with the knight on d7. This was the combination that finishes off, or this move finishes off the whole combination in style. Suddenly, Black realizes he's in huge trouble because moving the rook to either e8 or g8 is going to allow the white knight to come right back to f6 with a discovery. Those types of subtle move order exchanges at the end of very long combinations, again, things that were started way back on the move, knight takes c4, are very easy to miss when you think you're going for forcing lines. In forcing lines, you often consider the most forcing ideas. And so when someone changes the move order and plays the, the more subtle way to recapture material, it can throw you off and we can see even strong grandmasters like Moisenko blunder. So after rook g8, knight f6, we see that black actually was forced to just sacrifice the queen on d1 because if the queen moves anywhere else, not only are there chances to win back the material here, but even moves like knight takes h7 might just be lights out here very, very quickly. So on that note, Moisenko takes on d1. I applaud him for going for probably the best practical chance, which his hope is very simple. He's hoping that if I can somehow, some way eliminate the c and the b pawns together, then I actually have my knight, my rook against the queen on just one side of the board. I might be able to hold that. Unfortunately for him, the young man from Denmark was too tricky to allow that. He says, yeah, you're going to win back the b pawn, 
but your knight's not getting out. And on that note, after queen b3, the Ukrainian resigned. And I wouldn't say learned a lesson from the youngster at all, but just instructive for us to see why we want to study our tactics, why it's important at the end of long lines. We try to consider different move orders, things that are subtle, because it's very easy, especially in practical games with time pressure, to consider the most forcing moves when you're nervous, because you want to make sure those don't beat you. But always remember to check for the other types of move orders. And that particular knight takes d7, and the pattern recognition that goes with that idea to take with the knight, not the rook, and come back. Whether Bier had calculated all the way to see that knight takes h7 was also super strong, I don't know. But either way, a great win there for the young man, and uh, hopefully something instructive for all the viewers here. Speaking of things that are instructive, let me remind you to watch the official broadcast at chess.com TV and twitch.tv slash chess. Anna Rudolph and Danny King are crushing it because we're all trying to figure out who's going to win this event, take the spot at the Candidates Tournament and fight for an opportunity to challenge Magnus Carlsen in November. Thanks for tuning in. Please give this video a share. Give us a like and a sub. Reach out to me on Twitter if you want. You can see that information right there. Let me know how you're liking the videos. And I will see you around, not on the aisle, but on chess.com.